good morning, church. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. We are excited and delighted to see you here this morning. We are looking forward to what the Lord has to say to us in worship and song and preaching of the word. And so uh, we are glad that you are here with us. Uh, if you're visiting here with us today, a very special hello to you. We want to know a little bit more about you, how you found out about the ministry of First Baptist Church. So sometime during the course of this service, uh, if I don't get the chance to meet you until later on, find one of those visitor information cards. Uh, please fill that out. Let us know how you found out about us. But most importantly, how we can be praying for you. There are also some prayer request cards. We most definitely want to be involved in praying for you. So uh, last day of the month, we will observe our uh, monthly benevolence offering at the end of this service. We'll also observe the Lord's Supper at the end of this service, and so uh, we will invite those of you uh, who can and will to join us for that, and so uh, those of you who are tuning in through our live stream on social media, thank you for joining us. Well, I just want you to know that uh, this past Wednesday night, we prayed specifically for you, and prayed specifically for those who would be tuning in uh, through our social media platform and helping it grow, and so be praying that as the word gets out, no matter how, whether it's here live in person or through live stream, that it'll touch the heart. So God has promised that his word will not return void, but it will go out and accomplish that in which he has set it to do. So that is uh, our primary reason for being here today is for the study and the preaching of God's word and the reading of God's word. A real good Sunday school lesson. We want to invite you to enjoy uh, one of our small groups, if you're not in one already, we have a ladies class, a men's class, a couples class, a youth class, and the children's ministry is growing. So we basically have a place for you and your family to get plugged in here uh, in our small groups in Sunday school that starts at 930 every Sunday morning. Uh, one quick note, uh, make sure you get your monthly calendar that is in the bulletin so you don't miss out on anything that's coming up in the month. Uh, this week, uh, Thursday, is the National Day of Prayer. Uh, Morgan City will have theirs at noon at City Hall if you care to join that, if you're available. Uh, come be a part of what our city is praying for, praying for our city and praying for our city officials as we observe that. So let's all stand. We'll open up with a word of prayer, and we'll begin our worship service. Father God, we love you so much. And we just thank you for all that you're doing, Lord God. What a, what a glorious day it is to be here, Lord God. What a glorious day it is to enjoy the freedom that we have of worshiping you. And uh, we know that all glory, honor, and praise belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has promised that if he were to be lifted up, that he would draw all men unto him. And so that's our goal this morning, uh, is to see lives changed. Uh, we want to see you lifted up. We want to see you glorified. We want to see those that don't know you, Lord God, as their personal Savior to enter in a relationship with you. Uh, those who may be struggling, Lord God, we want their lives to be touched as well, Lord God, that they would be drawn back into that relationship, uh, that they would find the answers to the questions that they're asking. And uh, we just pray, Lord God, that as our family here at First Baptist Church continues to grow, uh, that you'll give us guidance, you'll give us strength, and you'll give us wisdom. But for now, Lord God, we turn our attention towards you, and we just turn this service over to you. Lord God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would fall upon this sanctuary in such a mighty and powerful way uh, that those even driving by on Highway 90 and on Victor 2 Boulevard, Lord God, that this, uh, your glory and your majesty would just radiate from this place and they'll know that something special is going on here today, Lord God. As we join our voices with thousands and millions around the world on this day, the Lord's Day, uh, we just pray, Lord God, that uh, something special would happen here among your people. And we just ask it all in the most powerful name there is, and that name is Jesus Christ, and in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Now, find somebody before you sit down, uh, shake a hand, hug a neck, tell, let them know just how glad you are to see them here today. I am so glad to see you. <laughs> I thought about calling him sick.
In Psalm chapter 119, verse 18, the scripture tells us, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things. What are you seeing around you? With all of the chaos and upheaval going in our, on in our world, are you seeing wonderful things? Are you sharing wonderful things? Let me encourage you. Just, just let people know that you love them and that God loves them. And, and I think that just makes such a difference in so many lives. They're looking, they're looking for love, and they're going to find it. So go ahead and share with them that you love them and God loves them. Let's sing wonderful words of love.
Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, today we are blessed to be in your house, Lord, to hear the word. Thank you, Jesus, for sending Brother Tracy and his family down to help us learn more about you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for the sin sick of this community that somehow the burden be put on their heart and work more for you. We do pray for the sick of this community, the well-being of this nation. We ask you to take these tithes and offers and your benefits. We ask it in thy name, Jesus. Amen. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, the scripture tells us, do this in remembrance of me. Let's sing. If you were given the responsibility of selecting a team, perhaps for a new business adventure, or maybe even a, a ministry that you want to begin, how, how would you select those individuals? How many would you choose? What, where would you go to get the resumes? What would be some of the top qualifications that you'd look for? If Jesus were to ask you, go, go and select the first disciples that I'm going to use to turn the world upside down, where would you begin at? Would it be by the seashore of Galilee? Would it be on the city streets? Would you look for scholars? Would you look for business-minded people? Would you look for those uh, who had a genuine interest for uh, the well-being of others around you? If you think about some of the challenges that Jesus ran across during his ministry, especially in the preparation of the 12 that he was working with for three years, there were a lot of hurdles that he had to overcome. There were a lot of obstacles that were generated by the religious people, by the culture. And so we began last week talking about uh, the compassion of Christ. You know, Jesus is the embodiment 
of God's love that we learned in Sunday school this morning. God is love. And his way of manifesting that love toward us is through the person of Jesus Christ. And for us to be compassionate to others, we've got to know Jesus and how he was compassionate towards people while he walked on this earth. During his three-year ministry, we would talk uh, last week about the feeding of the 5,000. We began looking at that. And chronologic, chronologically, all four of the gospel writers pretty much put the same events happening at about the same time. Jesus sent the 12 out to do ministry. They came back and reported to him all of the things that they did. Then the bad news came that John the Baptist had been beheaded. And so Jesus had to overcome that obstacle and had to take the disciples' attention off of that bad news and put it on something else. So after their ministry time, Jesus said, all right, guys, look, let's take a little time off. Let's recuperate from your time of ministry. Let's think about what's happened with John the Baptist. Let's re relax and rest for just a few moments because he knew that the next day was going to be a very busy day in ministry. And the story goes, we're looking in Mark chapter 6. If you have your Bibles this morning, that's the passage that we're going to be looking at. As Mark records this, this story about the, the multitude coming to Jesus to be fed, his feeding of them, they came to him looking for miracles. They had heard about what Jesus had done so far, his ability to... Uh, heal people and to touch people, but they were more interested in his teaching. And so as Mark records his gospel, he says when Jesus began that day, he looked up and he saw the multitudes coming. And Mark is the writer of action. You always see action in Mark's accounts that he has written. And it says that Jesus was moved with compassion upon the people because of this one reason. And, and Mark is the only one that emphasizes this statement that he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. So that's not the first time in the Bible that that particular comment is recorded. It's recorded in the book of Numbers. It's recorded in 1 Kings. Ezekiel also says the same thing. So Jesus makes a statement later on in his ministry about he and his disciples. He says, if someone were to strike the shepherd, then the sheep would scatter. And so there's a lot riding on that comment that Mark makes that Jesus saw the people as sheep without a shepherd. He was talking about that from a religious aspect. And he wanted to teach them about God's love. So it says that as they sat on the hilly grass side, out in a deserted place, he began teaching. And then all day long, from morning until late into the day is what Mark records, he taught them. He was becoming their shepherd. He was wanting to guide them. But at the end of the day, they said, look, we, we don't have anything to feed these people. The hour's getting late. You know, we can't just call up our waiter app and, and have some food brought in. We don't have a catering service. We can't call Domino's Pizza and have them deliver to them. What, what are we supposed to do with all these people, Jesus? And each one of the gospel writers records that there were 5,000 men plus the women and children. So we're looking at a crowd of eight to 10,000 people, easy, that were there. They had been there all day. They were in a deserted place. And one of the disciples said, look, Jesus, you, you have the authority here. Why don't you send them out to the neighboring towns, the cities, the farms, and let them find something else for them to eat? But Jesus turns the card on them, and he looks at the disciple, and he says, nah. He says, you give them something to eat. So as we look at the, the, begin, the continuing of this story today in chapter 6, uh, we begin uh, picking up in verse 37. And that's the comment that I just made right there. He answered them and said to them, you give them something to eat. So how stressed out would you be if you were that one disciple, eight to 10,000 hungry people that have been there all day long, and Jesus gives you that responsibility of finding something for all those people to eat? I think I would have just backed off and said, look, see you later. I don't know what to do or how to do this. This is not my calling. This is not what you have called me to do. But Jesus saw this as an opportunity to train his disciples. What was he training them to be? He was training them to be future shepherds. 
He was training them to do what he had done for that three years of ministry on his earth. He knew that his time was coming, that he would die on the cross, and he was in the process of preparing each one of those disciples to take care of a flock somewhere later on down the road. And so the title of this morning's message as we go into part two of the compassion of Christ is that you give them something. And the question that I want you to think about today is what is God preparing you to do right now in this moment? You, you may find yourself in a good place in life. You may find yourself in a comfortable place in life. Preacher, everything's good. It's going smooth. But you may find yourself in a crisis right now. You may find yourself in a situation where you really don't know what to do or how to handle it. What is God preparing you to do right now for future ministry and building his kingdom? If you have your Bible this morning, raise it up high. Hold it up high. I want to see that how many have a copy of God's Word. Good. I like to see that. I like to hear those pages rustle. We, we believe that this is the inspired Word of God. Therefore, we read it. This is the highlight of the week. This is the highlight of our worship service. So, Let's all stand for the reading of God's word, and we'll pick up part of two of this story, the feeding of 5,000, beginning in verse 37, but he said, uh, he answered them and said, you give them something to eat, and they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? A denarius was one day's wage for a laborer or a Roman soldier. So they said, we would need this much money to feed this many people. Otherwise, they're, they're saying, this is an impossible task, Jesus. We don't know how we're going to do it. And so Jesus sees the opportunity to present this as a training situation. But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. So John is the only gospel writer that includes the little boy with the sack lunch of tuna fish and crackers. Five loaves and two fishes. Mark doesn't mention that here. He says all we have is five loaves and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. They took up twelve baskets of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about five thousand men. Father God, we thank you so much um, for this event. Uh, we believe it to be true. We look to this, Lord God, as a miracle that happened from your own hands. We also look at this as a way of you showing compassion towards the people that day. You, you didn't send them away, Lord God, but you filled them yourselves with what you had. And we just pray, Lord God, that you'll teach us through this miracle um, how we can also do the same, how you are preparing us, and how we can trust in you, Lord God, in situations where we really don't know the answer or how it's going to be taken care of. Most importantly, Lord God, I just pray that you open our eyes and us at how you are the only one that can truly satisfy a thirsty and a hungry and a longing soul. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So the first point that I want you to see in this lesson, in this passage, we find in verses 37 through 40 is that Jesus takes this crisis and he turns it into a classroom. Jesus is the master teacher and he never wasted the opportunity. So here's the vision that Jesus is casting here. I have over 5,000 hungry people, 5,000 men plus the women and the children. I, I have 12 men who need training in how to feed their sheep. Let's not waste this opportunity. Let's take this crisis that some people see and let's turn it into a classroom. Let's turn it into an opportunity to teach them on how to rely upon God for every provision in their life. He says, I know that these disciples at some point in time will run into a crisis to where, where they don't know what the answer is going to be. So let's take it and turn it into a classroom. Let's take it and turn it into a training session that they will never, ever forget. 
One thing that people tell me all the time when I start inviting them to church, when I talk to them about the Lord, when I talk to them about coming to church and being a part of what's going on here, a lot of people will say, and you probably heard this response too, they say, you know, preacher, I'm not a real big fan of organized religion. <laughs> well, you just don't know the God that I know because God is a God of organization. He's not a God of chaos or not a God of confusion. So the first thing that Jesus does, he says, let's break this down into smaller groups. And what we start seeing here is our first vision, our first snapshot of how the church is going to function, how discipleship is going to take place. So we see Jesus as the good shepherd handing off to the under shepherds the instructions that they need to take care of these people effectively. And this is not the first place in scripture where we see this at. Moses, when he began dealing with the issues that the Israelites had, thought he had to do it all himself. But his father-in-law, Jethro, said, uh-uh. He said, don't do that. Find you some men that could take them into smaller groups. They'll handle the issues. Anything bigger than they can handle, they'll bring to you then. It's all about management. It's all about organization. That's why in our church we have the pastor. We have Sunday school teachers. We have smaller groups that could be tended to. And that's exactly what you're seeing going on in this group here. And so organization, that's what happens here. Where does discipleship occur? Well, when we think about this, it would be technically impossible for me to disciple each and every person properly in the confines of a church, or any pastor for that matter. So this is where one-on-one -on -one discipleship begins to take place at. It's more effectively done one-on-one -on -one than it is as a group. Where does discipleship occur? Where does discipleship take place? Does it take place in the worship service that we're in right now? No. It takes place outside of these four walls. It takes place outside in real life. It takes place in real life events. When a crisis occurs, you need someone there to help you and guide you and mentor you. And you need to be mentoring someone as well. So let's look at the place where they, they were at. Verse 35 says that they were in a deserted place. They weren't in a church building. They weren't in a structure. They were outside in the open. Verse 39, Jesus says, tell them to sit down in the grass in smaller groups. We're not going to do this all at once. But we're, you're going to have one group that you're responsible for feeding. And so the situation here unfolds. He wants, Jesus wants the people to stay. He wants them to learn. He wants them to eat. He wants them to grow spiritually. He wants them to watch what's taking place as he takes the fish and the bread, divides it upon, among the apostles, and they divide it to the groups that they are assigned to. But most importantly of all, he wants everyone to learn that was involved in that day. Not only the 12 disciples, but he wanted the people to learn this is what the church is going to eventually look like. So the deserted hillside became the place where the fundamentals of church and discipleship were first experienced. Jesus, the disciples, bringing the food to a lost world. The shepherd, the under shepherds, giving to the sheep that were without a shepherd. So that's the picture that we see here. Jesus takes this crisis and he doesn't waste it. Jesus takes this opportunity to turn a crisis into a classroom. So what's going on in your life right now? What type of crisis have you been through lately? What is the lesson that Jesus has taught you during that time? Has it drawn you closer to the Lord or has it pushed you further away? That's not, that was not the intention of it. Your situation will either make you bitter or it'll make you better. It all depends on how you respond to it. And so this situation that the disciples brought to Jesus said, Jesus, you've got to do something about this. He turned it on them. He said, I want you to give them something to eat. And they learned how to rely upon Jesus that day. The next thing we want to see begins in verse 41. It says, and then he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, and he looked up to heaven. He blessed, and he broke the loaves, 
And he gave them to the disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So up to twelve baskets of fragments and of the fish were taken up after that. An ordinary sack lunch that day for anywhere upwards of eight to 10,000 people, five loaves and two fishes, the impossible. Jesus took the ordinary and he made something extraordinary out of it. And that's what he wants to do with your life as well. You may say, God, you know, I really don't have that much to offer the Lord. You know what? He wants everything that you got. He doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter to him how little or how big it is. It doesn't matter how talented you are. Maybe you think you like the talent. Maybe you think you like the ability. Maybe you think that your life is just ordinary, humdrum, not a whole lot to offer. But God said, that's where I thrive the best at. I like to take the ordinary and make something extraordinary out of it. And that's exactly what he did this day. He took a Sack lunch of five loaves and two fish. They said, look, it's not much, but it's all we got. And Jesus says, you know what? That's all I want is all you got. Doesn't matter how big or ordinary it is. Doesn't matter how spectacular you think it might be or might not be. Jesus said, I want you to just give me all that you got. You let me handle the rest of it. So if Jesus tells you to feed them, and you don't think that you have enough, what are you going to do? If Jesus is telling you to give an offering, a tithe, if Jesus is telling you to give to someone something you may think that you don't have, what are you going to do? Are you going to obey God? Or are you going to try to reason it out? Are you going to try to put it into your calculator, put it down on pen and paper and see if it, it, it adds up? Or are you just going to say, God, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm going to obey you and I'm going to trust you and I'm going to do exactly what you tell me to do. As many of you know, uh, Pastor Charles Stanley uh, recently passed away just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Many of you have been uh, involved in his ministry. You've watched him on TV. You've heard him on the radio. I get the Charles Stanley devotional every day. Many of you have read his books. You've been blessed by his ministry. Here's what Charles Stanley used to say. Uh, it's something that I look at often. Uh, he says this. He says, obey God and leave the consequences up to him. Amen? Amen. Obey God. Leave the consequences up to him. In other words, God, I'm going to trust you I'm going to step out in faith. I don't know what the end result is going to look like, but I'm going to give you everything that I have, and I'm going to let you handle the results. And usually what makes sense, um, usually what doesn't make sense, typically that's where God thrives the most at. When it comes down to human reasoning, if it doesn't add up, if it doesn't make sense to us, that's usually where God thrives the most at. Because you know what? If we could figure out, if we could do it on our own, if we can say, look what I did, it's not of God. But when we step back and when we say, you know, I just don't know how this is going to work out, God says, all right, I got you right where I want you. I've got you in a situation where I can prove my strength and my might through you. Typically what doesn't make sense to us is where God thrives the greatest at. In this situation here, five loaves, two fishes, eight to 10,000 people, it just did not add up to the size. And that was the first thing they wanted to do is they wanted to put a dollar amount on it. Jesus said, don't add up. We can't afford this and we don't have enough to feed this crowd. Jesus says, all right, This is where I want to prove God can be trusted in the small details. So can you imagine if this miracle were to be performed today? Can you imagine if Jesus was here and he would start feeding a multitude that didn't have anything to eat? Can you imagine what the response from the crowd would be on that day? I would have to think that back in that time they really didn't think a whole lot about it. These people were in a deserted place. They knew they weren't going to get food from anywhere. I'm sure that they were very, very appreciative of what they got 
there on the hillside that day. But if that miracle were to occur today, can you imagine what the people would have said? Ew. <laughs> Did you wash your hands before you touched that bread? Who, who's got the Germex? I, I need to clean, I need to sanitize my hands before I start eating of this. Can you imagine what some of the people in the crowd would have said? Hey, have, have these disciples ever heard of latex gloves and hair nets? Do you know how unsanitary that is, them handling our food like that? You know what? I, I, I've got a, I got a wheat allergy. I don't, I don't think I can eat that bread right now. It, it might cause a, an allergic reaction of some sort. Is this gluten-free bread? What's the expiration date on that fish? <laughs> when did you catch it? Did, did you catch that fish? Did, did you test it for mercury poisoning? What, what's that fish got in it? Where's the tartar sauce? I, I can't eat my fish without tartar sauce, you know. But I would have to say in a more modern context, you would probably hear a lot more complaints, a lot more grumbling, a lot more belly aching, a lot more critiquing of what was going on in that situation. And after they got through eating, they'd probably say, mm, you know what? This bread's making me kind of thirsty. You didn't bring anything to drink. Where's the bottled water at? But that wasn't the response from the crowd that day. The disciples never, ever second-guessed Jesus. Do you see how quickly they sprang into action? He gave them the commands. Command the people to sit down in ranks. Divide them into groups. We're going to bless the bread, and we're going to give them something to eat. He took the ordinary and he turned it into the extraordinary. And so why did Jesus feed the crowd that day? Let's think about that for just a moment. Could he have easily just said, y'all, let's just go with the flow, what the disciples said, let's send them away, let's let them find their own food to eat. Why did Jesus feed the crowd that day? What, what does this have to do with the compassion of Christ? You've heard me say this before. I think Theodore Roosevelt coined the phrase, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. What was the topic that Jesus preached and taught on that day? I haven't got a clue. All day long, I, had, I would have to imagine that he spoke about God's love for them. Maybe he went over some of the Old Testament stories that revealed God's love for his people. The compassion of Christ. Mark records that he was moved with compassion and he saw the people as sheep without a shepherd. He wanted to not only teach them through the words that he spoke on that day, but he wanted to teach them through his actions and caring for them and feeding for them. And so think about that in your life as a Christian. It's real easy to say, you know, I love this community I'm in. I love this congregation that I'm a part of. It's real easy to say that. But if you're sharing the compassion of Christ with someone else, your action had better speak louder than your words. You better have the actions to be able to back up those words that you speak. Or are you just paying lip service? Or are you just saying that to look good and sound good in front of other people? If you really want to be like Jesus, if you really want to share his compassion, it's not just about speaking the words. It's about putting action to those words as well. And so I believe that on this day, Jesus was doing this more for the 12 disciples than he was for the crowd. You see, to talk about compassion is, is one thing, but to demonstrate it, it's a totally other thing. It's a totally different thing. So this poem by Ed, Edgar Guest uh, kind of summarizes that. And, and in your life, you know, you say that you're a Christian. You say that you're a child of God. You say that I believe the Bible. I love Jesus. And, and you go out and you share your faith with another person. It, it's got to be more than just words. If you're really going to share and show the compassion of Christ, You've got to show it through your actions as well. 
Edgar Guest wrote this poem. He said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. You go up to a person and you say, friend, I got some good news for you. God loves you. That's easy. Anybody can say that. And a lot of people say, yeah, I, I know that God loves me. But when you start showing them, even to the people that are difficult to love, then you are showing and demonstrating the compassion of Christ to another human being. And the whole reason that Jesus came to this earth was because people had heard about God's love. For thousands of years they had heard about God's love, but Jesus was the embodiment of God's love for us. And God said, I'm going to do more than just tell them about my love. I'm going to show them my love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the compassion of Christ, his feeding of the 5,000 that day, when he touched the blind person and made them see, when he went to the leper, some, a person that nobody even wanted to be around, Nobody wanted to even socialize with when he came to that leper and physically touched that person for the first time and no telling how long. He was saying, you know what? God loves you and I do too. But I'm going to do more than just tell you that I love you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to demonstrate God's love to you. And then when we hear that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, not only am I going to heal the sick and feed the hungry and heal the lame, but I'm going to show you God's love by dying on the cross and becoming the substitute for your sins. So here in this scene that all four Gospels record, the master teacher is teaching the future shepherds a lesson in compassion that they'll never, ever forget. And I believe it stuck with the majority of them. And I believe you can see that in the writers. Peter wrote about it. John wrote about it. So he left an impression on them that they would never, ever forget and that they would never, ever get over and as the shepherd fed his sheep on that day, after he resurrected from the grave, he, he met Peter on the, on the shore of Galilee. And he told Peter, not once, not twice, but three times. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do, do you really, really love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know how much I love you. He said, Peter, if you really love me, you're going to have compassion and you're going to feed my sheep. And that was a training session that Jesus took his disciples through this day. The last thing I want you to see is not only did Jesus take the crisis and turn it into a classroom, not only did he take the ordinary and turn it into something extraordinary, but only Jesus can take the empty life and turn it into a satisfied soul. I used this story to a group of students here a week or two ago, and I started talking about how we only had five loaves and two fish and eight to 10,000 people, and one of the students said, man, that must have been some little itty bitty pieces that he broke that bread into to feed that many people. No, that, that's not what any of the gospel writers record. They were satisfied at the end of the day more than they could eat. They all say that the, the, everybody there had all that they could eat on that day. Beginning in verse 42, it says, so they all ate and were filled. Some of the other gospel writers say that they were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. So they started off with five loaves, two fish, fed eight to 10,000 people. And then at the end, they had more left over 
than what they originally began with. All four Gospels recorded that they all ate and were filled. And John writes in his Gospel that they ate as much as they wanted. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think. That's the God that I've served. That's the compassion of Christ is to take the ordinary and turn it into the extraordinary. To see a hungry soul and satisfy it by the touch of his hand. Is there anyone here that can testify that God can miraculously provide far more than we expect? I know I can. Is there anybody else that can testify that? That God can provide at times when you least expect it. And that God can provide far more than we can ever imagine. Isn't it good to know that God loves us that much? Is there anyone here who knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that God has blessed you more than you deserve? I know I do. That's exactly what he did for the people on this day. They came empty and they left full. They came hungry. They left satisfied. The disciples came not knowing exactly what Jesus could do for the fellow human beings. But they left on that day with no doubt in their mind that when I get in a bind, when I get in a situation where I don't know what to do, that my God can and will provide far beyond what I ever imagined. Let me ask you this question. What is it that you're looking for in life right now? What is it that you're looking for? Are you looking for a relationship? Are you looking for satisfaction in a relationship? Are you looking for satisfaction in success, whether it be school or a business? Are you looking for satisfaction in better health? Are you looking for satisfaction in a higher education? Listen, only Jesus will satisfy this longing in your soul. Right now, there are a lot of people. You, there may be somebody in here. You, you just got this one hollow spot in your heart. You've got this one hollow spot in your life that you're trying to fill. You're desperately searching in all different places. You've got a longing in your soul. And you just say, I, I feel so empty right now. I'm going to search in every place possible to try to fill that empty spot in my life. Only Jesus can fill that for you. And a lot of those people, I would have to imagine that day, eight to 10,000 people, like sheep without a shepherd. They didn't know which way to go. They lost all sense of direction. They had lost their focus. They had been taught false things all of their life. They had heard about God's love, but they had never experienced before. And on that day, someone stepped in and said, let me show you through not only my words, but my actions of how God can satisfy that longing in your heart. So here's the thing. The very same hands that day that took the fish and the bread and broke them and blessed them and passed them out are the very same hands that one day took the nails to the cross of Calvary. On that day on the hillside, he said, I'm going to fill your stomach. I'm going to feel that hunger that your body is physically demanding. But on that day on Calvary, on the hillside, on the place called Calvary, he said, I'm going to take the nails that will satisfy the longing in your soul. This love for God that you're looking for, and I'm going to demonstrate it publicly. And out of all the miracles we'll look at over the next few weeks, none of them compare to the miracle of Jesus saving my soul from hell. He took my place on the cross of Calvary. He gave his life and he shed his blood. That's the greatest miracle of all. When one person steps into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, says, I know I'm going the wrong way. I know I've sinned. I know my life is not where it needs to be. God, would you please forgive me? I trust in Jesus. 
to save my soul for hell. That is the greatest miracle of all. And out of all the miracles we'll look at, there are none that compare to this. His nail-scarred hands right now, they're waiting to reach into your life and to say, I'll satisfy you like nothing else will. Are you satisfied? Is your life satisfied right now? Have you felt the touch of those nail-scarred hands upon your life? Has he satisfied that hunger in your soul? Jesus said in the Beatitudes, he said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Psalms 23, it talks about satisfaction. He says, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. If God is your shepherd right now, if he's your source of eternal joy, then you're satisfied. Psalms chapter 1 talks about the person who is in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like a tree whose roots are embedded deeply close to a river of living water. Its leaves are green. It bears fruit. It is satisfied in everything that it does. Jeremiah 31, 25 says, For I will satisfy the weary soul, and every languishing soul I will replenish. Isaiah 58, 11 says, And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. I'm sure that in that deserted place on that hillside, that crowd that day, they didn't come expecting to be filled. They didn't expect for their hunger to be satisfied. They didn't expect to be taught the way that they were taught. But at the end of the day, that hungry crowd left satisfied. And it was all because of the hands of Jesus. Psalms chapter 90 verse 14 says, Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. The compassion of Christ. Have you truly experienced that satisfaction that only he can bring? Or are you still searching? What are you searching in? Are you trying to do it on your own? Or are you trying to fill that empty spot with things that this world provides that can never ever feel that longing in your soul? Jesus is the only source of eternal satisfaction eternal joy, a peace that surpasses all understanding. And he's the only one that can reach into your life right now and say, I'll give you exactly what you need to satisfy that hunger and that longing in your soul. Every head bowed and every eye closed. As we continue to move through our study on the compassion of Christ, you're going to see each and every week how he interacted with individuals Constantly, not just once, but multiple times. He touched the people that nobody else wanted to touch. He interacted with the people that nobody else wanted to be around. And right now, today, you may be here. You, you may be looking for answers that nobody else can provide. You may have a hungering in your life. You may have a thirsting in your soul. Jesus said he is the bread of life. If anybody will come to him, he'll never hunger again. Jesus said he is the living water. If anyone drinks of the living water, they'll never thirst again. That is true satisfaction right there. Heavenly Father, we just come before you today. We thank you so much for all you've done. Lord, if there's anyone here that does not know you, that has never entered into that relationship with you. If there's anyone that is here, Lord God, that is looking for something that this world can't provide, I pray that they'll find it in you. And during this invitation time, Lord God, I pray that our hearts will be open to you to respond in a way that's obedient to what you're asking us to do. But Lord, most important that there's one person here that does not know you as their Lord and Savior. 
If they don't know where their eternal home is right now, Lord, I pray that they'll leave the day with that assurance and knowing that heaven is their home, Jesus is their Savior, and their life has truly been touched by you. Father God, if there is a person here that knows you, that they're a child of God, and beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have saved them, Lord God, but they're still trying to find satisfaction, Lord God, I pray that they would renew that relationship with you. Your word tells us to draw near to you, and you'll draw near to us. And I pray, Lord God, that each and every person would feel closer to you now than they ever have before in their life. So we turn this time of invitation over to you, Lord God that the saved would seek you more than ever, that those who are lost would find you, Lord God, and have that assurance of knowing that heaven is their home. We just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As the music begins,